Hey everyone, welcome to a new bonus episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, and three times over, I am a found footage fool. <laughs> Tell me the camera thing isn't annoying. Yeah, it's annoying. Hey gang, welcome back. This is uh, yet another bonus episode in lieu of a uh, full episode uh, where we have a special guest and talk about a specific movie and yada yada. Um, that, <laughs> that will happen again on this program, I assure you. Uh, I am at the tail end, the very end of my uh, sort of scholastic work. Um, and, uh, at least for the summer and that has just eaten up all of my time. If, look, I could, I could spend hours telling you about how this astronomy class has just ground me into intellectual dust, uh, and coupled with that, like some moving going on and, uh, some kid stuff and just all kinds of craziness. So I apologize for not having the, you know, breakneck pace of recordings that we've had in the past, but hopefully we'll get back to that this fall once uh, the the school is a little more meted out over the course of the week and I'm not spending literally hours a day uh, working on astronomy. Uh, th this very day, as I record this, I probably spent about five hours on nothing but astronomy homework and um, that, boy, just a real killer. Um, so, <laughs> but that's not what we're here to talk about. You're not here to listen to me kvetch about my scholastic issues no 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 we are here to talk about found footage movies and because this is normally the found footage full stuff it runs and eh, you know 15 20 minutes at most and this is dropping where a normal episode would go i decided well it would probably be more appropriate to uh do this with three movies instead of one and make it a little bit beefier an episode. I can't guarantee that it's going to be uh, an hour long. Uh, my guess is probably somewhere in the 30 to 40 minute range, but we'll see how it all goes. And uh, as always, thanks for, you know, sticking with me while I'm, I'm going through a lot of scheduling issues and just trying to figure out how to make my time uh, reappear, which has been uh, awfully tough to come by. But that doesn't mean I've, I've stopped watching movies and it doesn't mean I've stopped recording. So... Let's get right to it and start with uh, a, a movie that has been on the tips of a lot of tongues lately, and that is a movie called Incantation. And this is uh, another of the HBO, uh, I'm sorry, Netflix, uh, almost saddled HBO with, with all of this nonsense. Another Netflix horror movie who I would say have not been knocking it out of the park with their uh, horror offerings. Choose or Die was probably the last one I remember being a Netflix exclusive. And then that Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie fell in there somewhere. So, eh, not a great record. But Incantation, I would say, is better than both of those. But well, let's let's throw the analysis, okay? But there, So the premise of this is that you have a, a woman who is trying to uh, get custody of her daughter, has custody of her daughter, but it's real fringe you know like she's got some some history and her daughter appears to be seeing spooky and or supernatural things and through the course of the movie we realize that oh the mother actually did something that kind of brought this on the family and so the question is what do you do about getting rid of this and what actually happened that brought this curse on them and as we always do here on this program we are going to talk about this uh, in terms of five criteria that make for a good found footage movie. And the first part is uh, keeping the cameras on. It, is there a good reason to do that? And in this case, mostly yes, especially because there's, uh, you know, the, uh, the main character um, who is Lee is her name. And she and her buddies were doing kind of a YouTube ghost hunting sort of show. And so that is what captures, you know, all of the, uh, the stuff that happens in the past, all, all of the, the stuff that happens in this little village that appears to worship uh, this sort of lesser deity. And you're kind of picking apart um, what 
this deity is and what the worship is and so forth and translating the the actual prayer being said uh, to to the deity and so, and that stuff is probably the coolest and creepiest uh, parts of the movie but in terms of just keeping the camera on though that stuff really works it's when you get into the later stages of this when you're talking about you know her kind of documenting the uh, her raising of her child in theory it's so that she has proved that she's a good mother and that she's, uh, you know, behaving appropriately with her child and, and providing a good home. But that stuff kind of falls apart. I don't know that all of that makes perfect sense as to why we are filming all of this stuff. Like later towards the end, I get it. There's, there's another reason to do it. But especially in the early goings, not entirely sure... There's also a little bit of confusion here and there about how the, like who is holding the camera and why at certain points. And you know, that dogs a lot of found footage movies and it's not completely uh, head scratching and it, it doesn't lose me for that. But there were definitely moments watching the movie where you think to yourself like, okay, now who's filming this again? And why aren't they just helping instead of, just keeping the camera on because if they're there to in theory you know sort of capture parenting as it happens you really need to put the camera down and lend a hand um at any rate so keeping the camera on i don't think it's entirely successful but it's not a disaster either it, it, it's a little distracting and with a movie like this the more that you're taking me out of the movie and the more that i'm being distracted by it not so great right um, so then we get to characters. Are the characters any good? And this is really uh, a moment where Incantation, I think, shines a little bit. Because I do think the character of Lee is interesting. I, I don't really care for the construction of this movie. And we'll get to that in a minute. But as far as just a main character goes, I think she's sympathetic. I think she's compelling. Because we all, right, have those things that we have done in our past that tend to haunt us to one degree or another, like everybody lives with a degree of regret. And I think the movie does a good job of sort of exploiting that universal emotion and giving you an understanding of why Lee is doing what she's doing. Uh, like I said, particularly when you get to the end, which I will not spoil, this will be spoiler free. Hopefully all of this will be relatively spoiler free. And I, I think that stuff works pretty well. I think the character of her, you know, boyfriend and, and would be father, I don't know that that works very well. I don't know that it's all that well developed. There's a lot about this movie that feels a little half baked to me. And this is one of those things, the, the character interactions, I think the, the stuff between her and her daughter is good between Lee and her daughter not so much Lee and kind of everyone else in the movie. So I'm not bowled over by that. So characters, eh, good central character, everything else is a little shaky. I feel, um, then you get to authenticity, like within the context of the movie, does this feel real? And that I think works fairly well. Um, I don't know that it communicates the threat because part of the thing you, that you're doing is you're trying to uncover the nature of this curse that may be visited upon Lee. And as such, it, it sort of disguises the nature of what it is for much of the movie. And I kind of like that, that sort of investigative element of a lot of found footage movies. And I think this does that pretty well. Um, and, and within the context of the, of the film itself, it does feel like this all could happen within the universe that the movie creates. So I don't want to bag on the authenticity too much. I'll get, I'll get to my complaints here in a second. I think mostly it does feel like a thing that could happen within the world that the movie has made until you get to the end. And again, I don't want to spoil or anything, but it kind of blows up in a way that I'm like, well, this would be, you know, like earth shattering if the, if, if a video like this existed uh, and, and, you know, we don't see beyond, the movie itself. So who knows how, you know, well, I guess we'll see in the sequel 
how the universe reacts to the events of the movie, but we'll, uh, within the context of the film itself, I was like, eh, I, I, I feel like the end of this raises the stakes very suddenly and very, um, like it, 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 in a heightened way that I worry undoes some of the more personal nature of the film. Um, all right. So let's just get to watchability. That's our, our for, uh, that's our fourth rather, uh, criteria. And so, you know, let's just get to it. Um, watchability is really about, am I entertained by this movie? And, and I think one of the big problems of incantation is that it is terribly long. Um, it is round about two hours long, which is about 30 minutes more than I want to watch a found footage movie for. But that being said, I, I think that it, it, it gets better as it goes that by the end of the movie, I was more engaged in the last half hour than I was in the, in the first half hour. And that's not just because like, well, the first half hours where we're establishing all the characters and so forth. It just has a more, a, a greater sense of pace and you're unraveling all these mysteries. And this is where we get into the construction argument I have is that there is a lot of jumping back and forth between timelines of here is what happened when they originally went to this village years ago and, and sort of here, here is the fallout from it. And here's how Lee and her child are dealing with some of the things that happened during that visit. And I don't really care for that sort of like bifurcation of the story in this movie. I wish you had just gotten, here's what happened, jump forward a few years, and then here's the fallout of it. And I understand why you would do a construction like this, but I don't think it particularly works very well in, in the context of incantation, um, which, you know, it's a bummer because I do think that there is, there is good stuff to be had within incantation. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the guy who directed this also directed a movie called Invitation Only, which is sort of a slasher movie about a bunch of people being um, invited to an exclusive party. And I kind of think that that movie had some of the same problems this one does, not necessarily with the timelines, but just it, like it, all the good stuff is good, but it is just buried under a lot of stuff that I didn't care about. And, or, or I found it, I found it hard to get myself invested in. I, you know, to say I just didn't care about it is a little flippant, I think, because it's a better movie than that. It, it's, it's competently directed. It just doesn't hang together real well and in a really engaging way, which brings us to the final element of all this, which is scares. And is the movie itself scary? And I think that despite everything I've said about the movie and the narrative and that it's long and that the characters, uh, especially around the edges of the narrative, aren't all that interesting and that um, I wish that it was constructed differently and all of that stuff, there are some good scares in this movie. Uh, I would definitely recommend that you watch Incantation if you're... A, a nerd like me that just likes found footage movies. And especially if you are in particular a nerd like me, where the intersection of Asian horror films and found footage meets, you know, like, is this a gone jam haunted asylum? No, sir. It is not nearly that good or that effective. Does it have some moments that are pretty creepy? Sure. Sure. And you know, look time. I'll be the first to tell you, especially these days, time is, is, the most valuable co commodity there is. And there are better examples of Asian horror found footage. Like I said, Gonjiam is great. You can do Neroi the Curse. Uh, there are plenty of other movies that you can invest your time in. However, if you're just looking for something to watch and you like both of those things, which is, you know, sort of Asian ghost horror and uh, found footage films, then Incantation is okay. It's not terrible. Uh, and I, I think we're just going to leave it there. I, I don't think it's a great movie. I think it's merely okay. And, you know, one of the complaints that I have with my own evaluations of a lot of these movies is damning something with faint praise and, and feeling 
like I'm I'm giving a review that is ultimately a bit you know milk toast because I'm not telling you that it's really terrible like I don't have a hot take about it where it's like well this is just crap or this is the best movie I've ever seen it's it's got its its flaws for sure um, I think the biggest problem is that it's too long and that if you can get through the first hour of it, the back end of it's pretty good. Um, but if you don't want to waste your time with a two hour found footage movie that is only half good, I totally get it. And probably maybe ultimately that's my recommendation is that, you know, there are better examples of this. I wouldn't watch this unless you're just, you know, kind of fiending for this confluence of, I want an Asian found footage horror movie that I've never seen before. I mean, Incantation might fit that bill, uh, but I don't, I don't know that I would, um, I, I would recommend it beyond that. So, okay, enough about Incantation. Let us move on to the second of our trifecta of found footage movies. And this is less found footage in the sense, like, like Incantation is that style of found footage and found footage, of course, being an umbrella for sort of amateur video, right? That, uh, it's not purely found footage of, you know, Oh, here are some tapes we found in the woods. And, it, and that's the found footage in the case of incantation. It is, Hey, we are recording this to upload to the internet. And you're watching this as sort of a streaming, um, kind of affair without warning is a movie that was made in 1994. It was a TV movie um, with, uh, it, it has very heavy War of the Worlds vibes. And we'll get into that in a minute. But um, it, instead of it being, hey, we're uploading this to the internet, it is done um, kind of ghost watch style. And, and let me just say right now, this ain't no ghost watch. Ghost Watch is one of the best examples, maybe the best example of that sort of post radio, uh, you know, 1930s and 40s era of, hey, let's get one over on the people watching by pretending that this is real. Uh, Ghost Watch is great at that. It, it, it has the tone just right. This, uh, without warning, is a bit more dramatic. Um, and uh, like I said, it's from 94. And the, the premise of the, <laughs> of the movie, uh, the made for television movie that it is, is that you're watching, you know, like a movie of the week. It almost feels like a lifetime movie of somebody sneaking into a house while, uh, the guy's wife is having an affair and whatnot. And the movie is interrupted by a news report. That's like, Hey, there was an asteroid or uh, technically a meteoroid that, um, broke apart in over the North pole and three chunks of it came down and cratered in the middle of nowhere in the United States, China, and France. And so we're cutting to news reports, both in the U S in China and in France, um, where you're basically assembling information about these meteor strikes. And very quickly, the question becomes based on how they landed and the impacts and so forth, were these uh, just, it was this just an accident? Was this like an Armageddon scenario where, you know, this thing broke up in the atmosphere and it could have been really deadly, but it turns out it was okay. But um, the way that it came down, the exact angles that it came down, the fact that these were all identical ob objects that landed in identical places, geometrically speaking, was there an intelligence behind this? And so that is the, the movie you're watching is, Hey, as the news reports go on, there are more and more people that are like, Oh, this isn't just a random event. This isn't just a, a meteoroid that broke up into these three separate meteorites. And you know, there's nothing random about this. The thing that's kind of interesting about it is the cast because you have uh, Jane Kans Kazmarek who uh, most people may remember as Malcolm in the Middle's mom is the science advisor at the, the desk. Um, there are, again, ghost watch styles. Sander, yeah, Sander Vanneker and Bree Walker, who were both, you know, reporters and TV personalities that are 
uh, playing a, a reporter and the desk anchor, Sander Vandeker, is the anchor of this news program. And so they're sort of real world uh, analogs of themselves. And then you have an like interesting cast, like Philip Baker Hall is in this for a hot minute as uh, a doctor at the, at, at NASA, um, John Delancey, AKA Star Trek's Q is one of the reporters. A um, couple of other people you would recognize, like you would probably re recognize Spencer Garrett, who's uh, one, one of the uh, performers and uh, Dwyer Brown, who is one of the reporters. Uh, you know, there, there are character actors in these roles. And sometimes it feels that way. Sometimes this feels uh, more than a little hammy. But uh, what I like, I'm partial to these kinds of movies. I, I think that that, you know, hey, we got breaking news. Sorry to interrupt the program that you were just watching. And I think um, one of the, the places is like Grover's Mills or something like there's a a more than passing nod to um, War of the Worlds. And anyway, it's it, it's fun, you know, like this movie knows what it is and it knows what it's trying to do. And uh, and and I enjoyed that that aspect of it. So now let's apply our five criteria to this. Number one, keeping the cameras on. Does does the movie uh, make a good case for that? And because it is a news report and you're just going to different news uh, reporters and, and reports from around the world and all these different uh, journalists and so forth, it totally makes sense. Like it, it is as it's not authentic. We'll get to that in a minute, but it does exist in like the trappings are right. Um, as far as like, okay, we're going to go to this person now and then jump over and go to this person. This guy's a specialist from NASA. This guy is, you know, working at an observatory and has a different take on this. Here's the Pentagon's response to it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then you get into characters. Now, this is a little more difficult because there aren't, uh, there are characters that recur, you know, like Sander Vanneker and Dr. Carolyn Jaffe, who is uh, Malcolm in the Middle's mom, um, are kind of the prime characters. And then you have, you know, this dude in France that is uh, potentially burned up by um, one of these meteorites as it, as it lands. There's a little girl that had gone missing and shows back up. And so, you know, there are human stories being told here, but it's not like we are getting a whole lot of uh, backstory with any of these people. Like that's not the kind of movie this is in the same way that you don't get a ton of backstory, you know, from the radio play of war of the worlds about the characters. It's more about the event than it is about the people around the event. Um, although it does a pretty good job. There are some moments, especially towards the end where the threat becomes more real and there's a sense of like, Oh, well, if this goes bad, you know, tell my kids, I love them. And, Hey, it was going to be my birthday, but it doesn't look like we're going to make it kind of thing. Um, so it, it's, it's fine. It's, it, they, they probably do more than they have to in that regard. Um, it's not perfect. Like you're not going to roll a tear and you're not going to stand up and cheer for anybody, but it, you know, you, the characters are recognizable as archetypes and that's fine. Um, okay. So then let's get to authenticity. And because you're having character actors playing reporters, especially John Delancey, like I love John Delancey. Uh, his performance as Q is one of the great performances in science fiction as far as I'm concerned. But it does make it feel very staged. Like it doesn't feel real. And and that's a big problem for something like this because you want it to, like to, Ghost Watch feels more real than this. And Ghost Watch does you know tread into that realm of well this is all a little heightened and silly perhaps but it at least feels like it it is more authentic than something like without warning um so the authenticity maybe not so much they, it, it's a little hammy at times a little corny but then you get to watchability and the fact that this it was a tv movie it's only about 90 minutes long um, you're constantly jumping from one person to the next and then back to the other person to get a little bit more of the story pushed forward all of the time. 
Um, I think it's really watchable. You know, it's very it's very quick, and even despite all the corniness and and so forth, it's it's fun, and you know it, it it's a very good like sci fi. It's not really horror, I suppose. It, it really is more of a sci fi story. Um, but it it's one of speaking of Star Trek, it feels like one of those morality plays of like you know what if we were actually visited by an intelligence maybe we're not smart enough to handle that and maybe we're just not a wise enough species uh to to deal with that kind of thing with you know like the drake's equation thing of how many civilizations uh out there uh might be intelligent enough to communicate with us and and if that's the case is it a good idea there's also that great you know arthur c clark line about there are two possibilities when it comes to life in the universe one is that we are alone the other is that we are not and both are equally terrifying um and i think that this sort of deals with the idea of like maybe if there were intelligence out there are we counted among that number you know that just because we're able to sort of send probes out with uh, our uh, you know galactic address on them what does that mean if somebody were to try to communicate with us like how how would we deal with that and um so i think all of that really works i think the end <laughs> there's a really nice moment where it gives you a pretty good dipsy doodle as far as like oh you know every everything's going to be all right um but maybe not and I think that works pretty well, um, which brings us to our final uh, evaluation point, which is scares. Is this actually scary? And I don't know that it's scary as much as it is. I don't. It, it, there is an apocalyptic vibe to it that could be frightening to some people. You know, if you were watching this and you were a kid, I would be interested to hear if anyone saw this when they were young. Uh, by all means, drop me a line, which you can do at uh, uh, fa uh, Facebook uh, is facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash uh, Dark Parade. And you can also find me on Twitter at Dark Parade Pod or better yet, go to Discord and you can find uh, a link to our Discord at uh, uh, legionpodcasts.com uh, forward slash uh, the dash dark dash parade and uh our podcast the dash dark dash parade I, I believe is how it works um at any rate you uh, just search for the dark parade on legion podcast on the main page there's a, a link to the discord you get it um so yeah drop me a line there i would love to hear if anyone has actually uh seen this movie as a child and and if it disturbed them because i could see that being the case i remember saying um there's a similar film called special bulletin i i believe was the name of it that had to do with uh a, a nuclear um a nuclear strike and that came out that was like in 83 and i remember that being kind of upsetting um but i was also young when i saw it so you know <laughs> take that with a grain of salt but that's that's kind of what i'm getting at is i think maybe if you were a kid and saw this you would be like oh my god you know, the world is going to end, uh, which would be fun. So, um, but, uh, you know, for an, a regular schmegular person, do I think this is scary? Mm, probably not. It's entertaining, though. And you can find it on uh, Amazon for uh, like three bucks. So it was worth the three bucks I spent on it. I felt like you could probably find it on YouTube. It's probably there. But, you know, I'm all about supporting the artist because... Uh, I'm a superior artist type and I want to make sure that a couple of pennies fall into the pockets of the people who created it. You would hope. Um, but you know, I, I would say, check it out. If, if anything I have said, uh, appeals to you, it is a pretty good one of these. So I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, without warning, I was in the mood for something like this and I'd never seen it and it was good. It was good. It was exactly what I hoped it would be, which is kind of corny, but also very self-serious in the way that, you know, the, the uh, kind of moralistic sci-fi thing ought to be. Um, so, you know, take that as you will. Um, all right, let's get to our third and final 
uh, found footage film of the night. And this one is um, a little more representative of not necessarily found footage. It kind of falls back into the streaming kind of category, but um, very much set in the present day and very much about uh, the fact that everybody is, is sort of online all the time and living their lives in a streaming way and all of that. And I'm talking about the movie Spree from 2020, uh, starring uh, Stranger Things, Steve Harrington himself, Joe Keery. Um, and the premise of the, the movie is that the, uh, the main character, Kurt Kunkel, is trying to be, a, you know, an internet celebrity the way that everyone kind of is these days you know like everybody's got their streaming channels and their socials and that kind of thing and he ironically enough babysat a guy who ends up being a very popular streamer and he's just never kurt has never been able to put it together he's never been able to make this work uh in a way that gains him any popularity like you know when he streams, there are nine or 10 people watching and I get it. Like I've been there and, and you know, that's, that's kind of fine with me, but I'm an old, you know, I don't, I don't really care if anybody's watching. I, I do this stuff cause I enjoy it. Whereas he is very much living in a way to like the, the, the views are what matters. And um, so when he realizes that, Hey, he's never going to get, uh, the, the followers he wants just doing, you know, the stories about being a spree driver, it's like a, a, a Uber in spree or kind of analogs of one another for the movie that he's, he, you know, he can't just drive around pontificating and get viewers and followers so he's got to step up his game. He's got to do something more extreme. And that more extreme thing is that he is going to, um, you know, uh, start killing passengers. And along the way, uh, you know, the, the movie very smartly at times and a little more bluntly at others is skewering the idea of, you know, if if all you are doing is living for an audience, then who are you as a person? You know, are you just the, the, uh, like the, the thing that the audience wants to see, does that make you a human being? Um, you know, how, what kind of happiness, what kind of personal happiness comes out of being that sort of person who only lives to, engage with a, a social media audience and anyway um but it's it, it's an interesting movie it's got a lot of ideas going on at, there are times when it's very pointed about what the movie is about like it it is not subtle i would say uh it's got a pretty interesting cast aside from joe keery uh sashir zameda from saturday night live is in it along with kyle mooney who, who is also from snl um misha barton who has been in geez, a bunch of like B horror movies, uh, was, I think got famous on the OC is, is where she really became a, you know, sort of a celebrity of some kind, but has been in a million horror movies at this point. And, and God bless her, you know, like, I think she's fine in this, uh, David Arquette of scream fame, it plays the father who is a, a, a bit of a drug addict DJ kind of character. And one of the things I do like about the movie is that it kind of shows that this kid is Kurt is basically ignored by his parents to an extent that, you know, you, you allow that the, uh, this psychopath to grow, you know, um, and I, and I think that stuff works pretty well, but anyway, so that's, that's the premise. This kid decides to turn his, uh, his spree, um, car into a, a murder vehicle and, you know, all hell breaks loose. So, and so she is a maid, uh, we're saying she plays a comedian who, um, is sort of famous on social media 
and Kurt tries to sort of intercept some of her fame and success and anyway uh, really like ham-fistedly and you know the, like that's the thing is that the character of Kurt uh, comes off as being a little sad and pathetic um, and just like he's just lost he just doesn't know you know he says at the beginning of the movie when he's sort of addressing the camera is that he just doesn't know who he is that he's lost and he can't find himself and it's only in these extreme acts to, to get viewers does he seem to you know kind of find himself uh, but it's just because he's got attention you know his parents never gave him any attention not not a good kind of attention at least and so this is what he's left with and um all right so let's get to does all of this work and uh so you know our first criteria obviously is keeping the cameras on and uh yeah totally works like again this is a movie about a guy that's just living his life in the public sphere and whether or not anyone's watching or not so it makes sense for all of this to have been recorded and and at the end of the movie there's also sort of a suggestion that this was all compiled after the fact after the events of the movie um you know in, in a way to present to others of like hey this is the story of this kid um so i i think all of that works really well then you get to characters are the characters actually compelling and i i think that joe Curie actually does a really good job of making kurt lonely and sad and pathetic and funny at times and scary at other times and it's really good so sheer zameda also i think is is pretty good in the film um david arquette it plays a real great oblivious dumbass in, in the movie um and i think all of that works and then there are some side characters like the people who get in the car and we learn a little bit about them or at least you know the kinds of people they are their personality types and that stuff is pretty fun uh so yeah all of that i think works pretty well and and it's really joe Curie's show and if if he did not work in the movie then the movie would not work and he totally does um like i said he there are moments where he's He's so hapless that you're you're sort of laughing, you know, at at his bumbling, but then you stop for a second and realize, like, oh, I'm kind of laughing at the fact that he is just not great at murdering people, or, um, you know, oh, he's just this sad sack who doesn't understand that, you know, however many likes he's getting on this video doesn't matter, and you start to sympathize with him, but then you know, outcomes, some murder, and you're like, oh, right, he's a monster. Okay, right. I keep forgetting that he is a, an absolute psychopath. Uh, so all that stuff really works. Joe Curie does a great job in this movie. Um, authenticity, like, the, again, does all of this feel real within the context of the movie? And I would say absolutely. Like, as the movie goes on, you start to hear police reports about, like, oh, hey, there's some spree driver out there that's doing all this crazy stuff. And that works like it, it does feel like this is real you know or or certainly believable in the context of the movie so i i think all of that works real well um so yeah i do think that uh, the authenticity factor is pretty high um even in the aftermath of like here's what happens in the wake of the film i think all of that stuff feels authentic in as much as um, the movie kind of gives you a postscript on, on what life is like after, uh, Kurt goes on his spree. Uh-huh. Double entendre. See? Um, which brings us to watchability. Um, and I think you can tell by the way that I've been talking about it, like, this is a very watchable movie. Again, the, it, it's about 90 minutes long. Uh, so it does not overstay its welcome. It, it's interesting. It's well acted. Um, it, it's not totally new in in what it is saying uh, in the context of the of the movie. Um, I don't think anyone is going to think that like, oh my god, they've reinvented the wheel with this film. But I look, I'm one of those people that believes that social media and constant online presence and that sort of thing is ultimately a negative. 
um, which is ironic to say on a platform in which I'm distributing it on the internet. But, you know, I also don't spend that much time on social media and, and certainly not streaming. And if I am streaming, it's, Hey, here's a dumb horror video game that, uh, I think we all ought to play together. Um, and maybe I'm just justifying, right. That sometimes I do the thing that the movie is criticizing and I myself criticize, but I think it's just all about where you find your, your sense of self and your, your happiness And, you know, the online stuff that I do is a goof and it's fun and I have a good time doing that. And it's not the thing that generates my sense of worth. And I think that's where, you know, the, the movie spree kind of lives in examining that of, you know, if you believe that how many followers you have on Twitter or Instagram or how many people are watching your latest video stream. If that is where you are getting your joy, then you're in a dangerous place. And, you know, having spent time with my, my uh, girlfriend's kids and being a little bit surprised to see, you know, how wholly they have been consumed by like YouTube videos and stuff like that. And the idea of putting yourself on camera, even when you're on, uh, when you're at a young age, it just seems like, well, that's what you ought to do. You know, that you ought to be playing a video game and making dumb sounds and, and bad jokes while doing so. And of course they're not allowed to do any of that, but they absolutely would without, (laughs) without supervision. That is absolutely, absolutely what they would want to be doing. And that kind of stuff is really crazy. You know, it's, it's, I heard someone refer to all of the internet age and particularly the streaming age as this grand social experiment that we're conducting on children with no idea of what the repercussions are. And so on that level, Spree kind of spoke to me because it's stuff that I think about and, and it's a subject that I find, you know, as a sociological experiment to be really interesting and what it does to uh, people's brains to constantly need external validation for their worth. And that hasn't changed. Like that's something that's been with us forever. The difference is that the, the highs and lows of that have never been more attainable, you know, because it takes almost nothing these days to be online, uh, in that way, like having your life presented online and having, you know, the internet perceived as the world at large reject that can be emotionally crushing. And can lead to, you know, sure, this is the extreme. Spree is the the illogical extreme of that. But that sense of isolation and alienation and that you are somehow wrong or different uh, because you are not popular, um, you know, that that is a universal. uh, You know, I remember being a kid myself and struggling with, you know, being, uh, being different or perceived as weird. And now, you know, but the audience for that was a, a couple of hundred people in my my high school or middle school, and now blow that up to the world that is online, um, and that stuff gets uh, a little more dangerous. I think you know, like we we all have those those feelings of insecurity and and imposter syndrome and that kind of thing. Um, so I th- I think the movie like it doesn't do an expert job of dealing with that stuff, but I'm more inclined to watch a movie that is dealing with those ideas on some level and, and giving it some, some points for that. So, so watchability is where we started with all of that. And I think the watchability is actually quite high. I I really enjoyed my time with the movie. I found it to be thought provoking, but that's, like I said, your mileage may vary because this is a thing that I think about a lot anyway. And, um, and, and what, you know, being online all the time is doing to us as a species. So, uh, but I enjoyed that part of it. And then, and then finally we come to scares. Is this movie actually a scary movie? And on that level, I don't know that it is like, I don't find, or I don't find the moment to moment scenes in the, in the film frightening, you know, some of them are funny. Some of them are a little surprising. Uh, there, there are some good, you know, like left turns that the movie takes, no pun intended, uh, that I found to be enjoyable, 
I don't think it's scary as a film, at least not in the details of, of the action. Conceptually, I do think it's kind of frightening because, you know, we've already seen that there we live in a world where people are posting their murders online. You know, that is not a fiction. That is a thing that has happened. And that stuff tries to, you know, get scrubbed off the internet by the platforms that host it pretty quickly. But that stuff's out there. If you want to go looking for it, you know, we live in a world where you can, if you want to see somebody actually being beheaded, you can see that. If you want to see somebody who has gone into a school or a public venue and, and murdered people, if you go into the bowels of 4 chan or whatever, I am sure you can find those videos still. And that is terrifying. Like, we, we live in a world where manifestos are being copy-pasted before uh, murder sprees. So, you know, th that is the level that the movie works on, for me, that I find frightening, is that this is not ridiculous. You know, the, the, some of it is, is heightened and some of it is borderline silly uh, in the film, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. Like, everything that happens in this movie, not, not impossible. You know, unlikely, sure, but not impossible. And, and that's the thing that I find very frightening. I, th I think there are better versions of this idea, probably. You know, maybe Mother of Monsters is certainly a grimmer look at something like this in the found footage realm. Um, but there is, there is something about like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, uh, record my evil and distribute it online. Um, that is, uh, that, that's kind of terrifying. And I don't know that I would call this movie terrifying. I think the ideas un underpinning the movie are kind of frightening. Uh, but I don't think the movie itself is scary. I think it's more entertaining and, and potentially thought provoking. Uh, but it does, again, uh, one more shout out to Joe Keery, uh, as Kurt in the movie, who I think does a, a very, very good job in uh in portraying this character that is at once very sad and very lonely and and empathetic and also being frightening uh at times uh or the character being frightening so um okay that's it that's a threefer right there folks and uh in in very short order we should be back to doing you know actual episodes uh as, as i may have said in the upfront my uh my classes my summer classes which are the accelerated classes end this year week and so i'm looking forward to uh to getting back to uh to more normalcy in the uh in the recording schedule and and have some interesting things planned um there's some stuff that i really want to do and one of the things that's been you know a blessing and a curse simultaneously the the curse being i haven't been able to record as much as i would like and in the way i would like uh, where I'm doing a much more organized kind of show. The blessing of that is it's given me time to think about like, oh, well, what do I want to do, uh, you know, when I'm able to come back and do normal shows and, or, you know, the main episode kind of shows. And um, I've got some ideas about that. I think I want to explore books a little more. So, uh, you know, you have been duly warned that things may get a little more literary around here. Um, anyway, that's going to do it for this time. As always, I really appreciate you hanging out, being patient with me uh, as I am going through summer astronomy classes and, and losing even more of my sporadic hair. And uh, I, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, it was fun to kind of talk about some of these found footage movies I've been watching and, and, uh, going deep on spree in a way that I, I didn't really expect that we would, but so be it. Uh, as I said, you can find, uh, me on the social media, speaking of spree, um, at, uh, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash dark parade. And, uh, you can also find me on Twitter at the dark parade, which I am just now realizing I have not, uh, checked in a few days. Um, but, uh, you can absolutely message me there. And, and as always, please, 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 if you really want quick responses, uh, out of me and mine, then, uh, head over to, uh, legionpodcasts.com 
the uh, the website where you can find everything uh, good and wholesome on the internet. And uh, from there, you can find uh, The Dark Parade and as well as a number of other great shows. You know, like, let's not uh, let's not sell anybody short here. Um, the uh, Legion has been I, like, I'm no longer in charge of Legion, which is kind of great and, and weird all at the same time. Um, but you know, still, still going strong, still doing, um, great work, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, Friday nightmares, whether it's, it's psychosemantic, whether it's cinema psyops, still holding it down, um, all of that stuff. And, uh, yeah. So, you know, check it out. There's lots and uh, lots of cool stuff happening around Legion podcast, even though I'm not the one on, uh, with my hands on the wheel anymore. But, uh, as I mentioned, you can go to legionpodcast.com forward slash the dash dark dash parade. And there you can find links to uh, Facebook, Twitter, and discord and all of that stuff, as well as all the old, uh, back episodes. So, um, be back very soon, uh, to the tune of next week to do, uh, some more stuff. I'm, I'm unsure what next week's episode will be. Um, but once, uh, my class is done, I will certainly turn my attention, uh, towards, uh, making that, uh, something hopefully kind of celebratory and special, but we'll see, uh, what time allows. And, uh, in the meantime, thanks as always, uh, for joining the dark parade. We'll see you next week. <laughs>